that sometimes anxiety and depression can be a marker for the onset of epilepsy. And what that tells you is that anxiety and depression are part of the same underlying pathology that produces seizures. Who cares if somebody's seizures are controlled if they don't want to live anyway? Well, that's what I've been known to say at conferences. And my point being that psychiatric symptoms, commonly depression and anxiety, but often others too, need to be simultaneously addressed alongside seizures because it's not just about seizure control. We are going to hear all about that from top neuropsychologist, Professor Gus Baker in today's episode. If you're new and you haven't done so already, please do like and comment on this episode, subscribe to our channel so as to get more people learning about the epilepsies. For the past 30 years, I've been uh, a clinical academic working in the field of clinical neuropsychology. And I've sp spent my whole career working within the field of epilepsy. I started at the uh, Walton Centre for Neurology and Neurosurgery in Liverpool, and I remained there for 30 years. Couldn't find a better job. And uh, since I've uh, retired from the university hospital, I now serve as the Secretary General for the International Bureau for, Ele for Epilepsy, which is uh, an amazing organisation that I know you're familiar with, Tori, and I'm sure many of the listeners today will also be familiar with. Uh, and that's been a, a great honour and a privilege to do that. Well, it's great to hear from somebody such as yourself, clinician and researcher, actually seeing things from the perspective of the person with epilepsy and the family, because often there's a bit of a sort of, not necessarily two-tier, but a real division between clini clinicians, researchers and people with epilepsy. But I, I like to see that mix. It's great. So most of the research that I've done uh, has been based on uh, interviews and assessments of individuals with epilepsy. So I've not come up from a, a clinician, from a clinician's perspective of saying, this is what I think from our research, but this is what I think from the people I've interviewed with people with epilepsy. And this is the findings of that research. Could you please provide us with some statistics, which I know is kind of hard, but statistics on people basically who've experienced epileptogenesis, I guess, they've experienced epileptic seizures, but also what else? I need to first of all explain that there are lots of population-based studies out there and uh, each study has produced a unique response in relation to the incidence and prevalence of, uh, of particular comorbidities in epilepsy. So we have to just bear that in mind that there is no definitive figures but let me just tell you about the the rough numbers that we've understood from those studies first of all depression anything between 13 and 36 percent of people with epilepsy are likely to experience depression and that's you know that's interesting because that's compared to 10 percent of people without epilepsy having depression so we know perhaps two to three times incidence of uh, of uh, depression if you have epilepsy. We know, for example, if you look at the uh, bipolar disorder, about 12% in the, in the population of people with epilepsy compared to 1% in the normal population. So big difference. Yes. Anxiety, we know that um, anything between 20 and 30% of people with epilepsy will experience uh, anxiety. And of course, the more challenging epilepsy you have, the more likely you have to uh, to have a, uh, anxiety. And we know that psychosis in people with epilepsy is somewhere in the region of 2 to 7%. So if you take the overall global figures, we think it's probably that any psychiatric disorder or psychological disorder about two to five times uh, larger than the normal population. Do you think that's, or do you know if that is because of, um, does it come along biologically with whatever causes seizures or is it a, is it due to social differences or can it be one or the other or a combination? And that's a really good question, Dori. And, you know, um, most of these population-based studies have, work, have looked at um, the using questionnaires to identify whether somebody meets the DSM classification for depression. They haven't actually examined it in any detail, whether in fact it's um, a, an endogenous depression that is related to factors to do with epilepsy, or whether in fact it's a reactive depression, 
that is the consequences of trying to adjust to having epilepsy and all the comorbidities that go alongside it. So, for example, we know um, with endogenous depression that there broadly there is a dysfunction in the limbic system that might be associated with epilepsinesis or that certain anticonvulsants may also produce um, uh, impairments in central emotional uh, mechanisms. So th there are a number of potential factors that can cause depression. And of course, um, on the, the psychological and social side, we know that if you have epilepsy, you're less likely to be married, you're more likely um, to be unemployed, uh, you're more likely to experience issues, issues with uh, low self-esteem and, and, uh, and, and mastery. So there is a lot going on that would make a person um, experience anxiety and depression as a consequence. So do you think that because we don't really have a definitive answer to my former question, that is something we need to look into in order to be able to I was going to say treat, but also prevent, ideally. Yes, because I think what the uh, the treatments that we might want to use, depending on any one individual, will obviously, will obviously uh, depend on what the formulation is of that person's depression. You know, do they have an endogenous depression that's uh, part of their epilepsy? Or is this a depression that's arising out of a response to their condition? Some of the research that I've been involved in clearly identify uh, that uh, that depression seems to be a marker for the onset of epilepsy. Yeah, this is just personal experience, but I had such depression, suicidal ideation before I was diagnosed. And I'm not saying that the seizures hadn't started by that point, but I'd read a paper about this as well and how sometimes those symptoms precede seizures is that correct that is so we we did a, a very important uh, study of course i'm saying that because i was involved and I, but of it course. was we were able to identify that um people with newly diagnosed epilepsy who hadn't uh started medication and who'd only had one or two seizures were already clinically anxious and depressed there was a strong uh, number of, of those respondents. So we uh, so we look back at a number of different studies over the years, and it's clearly that sometimes anxiety and depression can be a marker for the onset of epilepsy. And what that tells you is that anxiety and depression are part of the same underlying pathology that produces seizures. I mean, we generally talk mostly about anxiety and depression because they are the most common. But also, I mean, I've read that you're much more likely to have schizophrenia, for instance, if you have an epilepsy and vice versa. Do, do you, could you tell us anything about that and other disorders? Because you mentioned psychosis, for instance. Psychosis does occur, but it is, you know, in, in terms of the number of people affected, it's a very, very small number, particularly when you compare it to anxiety and depression. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are... Again, if somebody does have psychosis, it is really important that they access the the right level of uh, uh, treatment as soon as uh, as soon as possible. So, heaps of neurologists, epileptologists, um, and clinicians often, in general, can be a bit nervous talking about anything to do with psychiatry. And there's a clear division, unfortunately, generally, I think, between epileptology and psychiatry. Um, if would you have any tips for clinicians if they're not they don't feel very comfortable asking about a person's mental health? Well, I, I suppose the the important thing is to recognise that the management of epilepsy is 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 not simply just the treatment of uh, of seizures, and that if you really want people to be well as a result of uh, of your of your management of their condition, you need to address all of the uh, all of the aspects of epilepsy which including the comorbidities so we for, for example we know that people when they're less anxious and less depressed they manage their condition much better and so you know and and, and you have to accept that given the uh, incidence rates there is going to be uh, in any clinic a number of patients who are going to uh, have anxiety and depression and you i think we owe them a service to identify that and look at how it's managed thank you as a 
patient, I agree. And honestly, we people with epilepsy and families indeed will love you all the more if you help improve our overall quality of life and don't just look at seizure control. I think that we, in in the best centres, you know, there usually is a, uh, a psychiatrist and a clinical neuropsychologist making up the team. And uh, th- there is also epilepsy nurse specialists. And they have a specific uh, remit really to address these comorbidities. So p- part of the uh, problem is, is, first of all, making sure that if you, are, if you have epilepsy, you know, are you experiencing the comorbidities? Can they be identified? And if they're identified, what's going to be the management of those conditions? So, in, for example, if somebody is uh, anxious or depressed, you might want to prescribe antidepressant uh, or anti-anxiety treatment. Uh, but you can also think about uh, not only just prescribing medication, but about behavioural uh, treatment as well. And th- we know that from the NICE guidelines that the best treatment for depression, for example, is an anti-depression treatment alongside a programme of cognitive behavioural therapy. And that, that, that produces the most optimum outcome. And I'd like to make sure that if a person is attending um, an epilepsy clinic, that, you know, at least one of the questions that the that that's asked is how are you and how do you feel two simple questions that that should be when in the uh in the dialogue that goes on between uh, a person with epilepsy and their their uh, their clinicians who are looking after them so we spoke a bit about this before but you mentioned self-management um, by people with an epilepsy. What, tell us about that. One of the desires, certainly for me and, and and also for the IBE, is to really try to make sure that people with epilepsy uh, become ambassadors for their own condition. Mm-hmm. So that they're able to talk to uh, their clinicians, their family members, their friends, people that they have relationships with about their epilepsy. They have the basic knowledge to be able to part, part that knowledge to others so that others will understand exactly what is epilepsy and what isn't epilepsy. So I'd like everybody, with, uh, every, pe- every person with epilepsy to have a really optimal level of knowledge about their condition. What type of epilepsy they got? How often they have seizures? Um, how is it being treated? What are the triggers for their seizures? Uh, how are they managing their anxiety and depression? Do they understand it as much as they should do about their condition? Do their family understand about it? Do their friends about it understand about it? You know, do they know the risks associated with epilepsy? Do they know how to manage their epilepsy so that they reduce the chances of having a seizure? I'd like them to be really well informed and educated because I think that's a really good way of managing the condition and I, I say to my friends if you had a, a condition that you know you'd never had before and you didn't know about it what would you do about it and then they would they all say go straight on the web look at it work out what it's about work out who do I need to see work out how we're going to manage it yes I think so education is power and sometimes it can take us a little bit longer to learn things some of us cognitive issues a lot of the time not everybody but some of us but keep reading if you can or if you're a caregiver please keep reading and also I think uh, appreciate that not everything you read is real so go to uh, sources that are reliable like IBE like Epilepsy Sparks like Epilepsy Action Society yeah, say it, Harry listen to your web your webinars that's Thank a really you. good source of information <laughs> and you're, you're, I, I certainly do listen to them because you oh uh, do you oh yeah, you're, thank of course, you you've had some great uh, great people on there talking about it but yeah having a good source of information um to be able to draw upon is really important so in the IBE we've you know we've developed toolkits and we've developed a special uh, knowledge hub so that people can access information about their about their condition about the the best way to manage it and that's access uh, accessible to people from all over the world as well isn't it it's not like people can hear we're from the UK but it's not limited to people from the UK any place on the globe right absolutely we're doing our best to uh to to present 
the information that we produce in as many different languages as possible. Thank you to Gus for driving home the message that epilepsy isn't all about seizures and that we, people with an epilepsy, caregivers and clinicians, need to see and bring up mental health in order to improve and sometimes maintain, fingers crossed, people's quality of life. Check out more about Gus and his work on the website torierobinson.com where you can access this podcast, the video and the transcription of the entire episode, all in one place. And if you're new and you haven't done so already, please do like and comment on this episode. Subscribe to our channel so as to get more people learning about the epilepsies. See you next week.